So now we come to another facet about this whole story that gets to where we live. We were, um, I was trying to explain the sort of basic elements of training where you regard yourself as a public person and on everything just for the practice of it you develop something of a policy and you know how fast and loose you want to be or how anal you want to be about that is you know up to you um, the third thing was to regard everything in your periphery as if you owned it as if you were king over it and how do you relate to it in that regard especially with respect to personifying the things you own because there will be people so many in the eternal state who will basically be doing very menial things I mean it'll all be light years higher than down here I think maybe not but there will still be the majority you know you're talking 90 percent will be engaged in relatively menial jobs and they'll love those jobs it won't be like down here because in the eternal state everything will be baptized with a God meaning that everybody's gonna know and so I mean even taxes is called a glory now, I can't wait to see that in Revelation 22 I think it's 22 it might be 20 22 21 22 something like that where it says the kings will bring their glory into, you know, Jerusalem. And uh, that I want to see. Because I've dedicated my whole life to legal avoidance of taxes. Um, so it could mean that, there, that the menialities that we have down here are preserved. As a sort of memorial. And the joy of it will be, gee, it was such a horrible thing to have... You know, to clean a toilet down here. Of course, we don't have to go to the bathroom there. But it was such a horrible thing to have to wash dishes. Of course, food is not something that everybody gets to have up there. Um, there's going to be some kind of menial stuff that is counterpart to what was down here. Only up there, it's going to be enjoyable to do it. I mean, that's the ultimate justice. Is to take a thing that was so horrible to do down here and turn it into a joy. I mean, that's what the cross is. So I'm not sure how much upgraded the physical life is going to be. Our mental abilities, yeah. Our ability to appreciate the Lord, oh yeah. But society, I'm not so sure how different it's going to be. Except that there's no sin in it. Which means we're really going to finally enjoy ourselves for the first time. Okay. That being said, the third thing was, okay, somebody is going to have the equivalent of being a dish or a spoon down here. In other words, a low-level position of doing what is essentially a physical operation. And they're going to love that job. It's really going to be fulfilling from the least to the greatest because of the baptized meaning that's on it that we're all going to know. I mean, you know, sometimes it can be really enjoyable to do something menial. It's just like a relaxation. And, you know, especially humans being what they are, we love our little parades. You know, we love our little get-togethers and decorating the tree. I mean, that's really a menial activity when you think about it. But n nobody who's decorating a tree thinks of it as menial, even though that's what it is. We enjoy something simple. It's going to be a lot of simple jobs in eternity. That's the point I'm getting at. So how do you relate to a person who's got a simple job? So treat the implements, because instead of having physical slaves, we got things that do slave work like remotes to turn on our TVs. What if that remote were a person who's turning on the TV for you? So that was the third thing. The fourth thing, um, I can't even remember what it is now. Uh, well, whatever it was, it was in the last increment. 
there's one more thing to take into account as far as being a king is concerned in the eternal state and that is the fact that basically each one of us is going to have a communication job of some kind we're getting trained about that and that's the one thing that most Christians are even cluing into but they do it wrong down here the whole idea that everybody's going to be living on in heaven is that we're all just, just it's just about the Lord and that's it that's all anybody's going to care about so he's going to be the constant topic of conversation the kings so this, this is the part that bothers me are always going to be in the news every little thing the king does everybody's going to ooh and ah over it and just like we're ooing and eyeing over him now, and we're all going to be ooing and eyeing over him forever and eternity. Okay? That will be the number one topic of conversation. Oh, the Lord said this. Oh, the Lord said that. Oh, here's this about the Lord. Or did you notice this about the Lord? Oh, the Lord did this three days ago. Or this and that, and this and that. And we're all going to be talking about Bible all the time. Okay, that's going to be the consuming interest of everybody. By you know, everybody's going to want to talk like that. We're not going to be occupied with the kind of stuff we're occupied with down here, the way we're occupied with it down here. In other words, if we still, I don't know if this is going to happen, but if we still have sports, okay, the meaning of the sports to us then would relate to him. Something that the sport reveals about him. Okay? That what it depicts about him. Or doctrine. And everything's related to him. So that being the case, there's going to be a communication function that everybody's going to get from the highest to the lowest and you see that already in heaven now I mean lots of references to it that's what the angels do they communicate they don't just communicate to us we don't see them much but they're busy doing stuff and I'm going kind of full circle and I'm, this is just sort of a speculation I'm, I'm not sure I buy into the idea that the universe is like a set of natural laws anymore because it would be so meaningful if God gave the angels that kind of stuff to do it would be meaningful for them and they're just so good at it we think that they're natural laws okay and I mean the atheists would scoff at that because you know like in ancient myth days you know, there was the god of the rain and the god of the oceans the god of this element and that element okay well what if angels actually did have charge over those things and they ran them like businesses because it's fulfilling to them it gives them something to do you know so in the eternal state I would think there'd be a whole lot of that in other words it's not automated. It's done by hand. It's labor intensive. Not because it's low technology, but because it's more enjoyable. Again, the whole concept that God's designing all this around is to maximize the enjoyment and high and low together. That's the fundamental reason why it doesn't matter about inferior and superior. There is such a thing. Nobody's equal. Everything's unique. And the idea is to maximize out the enjoyment of the relationship. One of the problems, and we all went through this, of automation is that it depersonalizes interaction. We want convenience, and we want things to be cheaper, and to the extent that it's labor intensive, it's more expensive, it's also less standardized. We want a certain standardization of quality. Okay, but if you're perfect as a person, 
would you rather snap your fingers and have a pair of shoes or would you rather maybe go to the trouble of making them yourself I mean we all are kind of like that there's certain things we like to linger over me if I have to do more than nuke a chicken for five minutes that's too much cooking but I'm not always like that sometimes I like to start like about two o'clock in the afternoon and there's a certain kind of five or six or seven meals I'm actually good at that I spend time making not a lot of time it's mostly time cooking not making but I mean sometimes you like to linger over the production of the thing over its creation I love lingering over the web pages I love lingering over the videos I spend too much time on them okay but I don't want to spend more than five minutes to eat it's just generally speaking too much trouble okay but there are other people out there they would love their idea of heaven is to spend all day preparing and cooking one meal they just love everything about the process all right so God isn't going to deny that you see what I'm getting at here what's really good what ought good to be God's answer is that it's not good if it's not enjoyable of course his idea of what enjoyment is just freaks us out because to him it's not enjoyable unless everything is included no matter how low this is what's killing Satan this is just he just can't Satan would just you know snap his fingers and zap everything if he could and he doesn't understand why God doesn't like to do that God does like to do that at certain times in certain ways for certain things and other things he likes to linger like look at the trouble he's going through for us he's pouring himself on to us line on line precept on precept is the way you learn what, he could just snap his fingers and I'd have the whole Bible, every language on the planet, everything perfectly understood and known. And I could therefore perfectly answer any question about the Bible. In a nanosecond, he could just will it and that's the way it would be. But he doesn't. He feeds me versus slowly. Sometimes he feeds me seven or eight or ten of them at once. And I'm not sure I heard him right. So I have to go back and slow down. A lot of times he gives me the answers to things and then I have to go do my homework, you know, like researching on the internet, looking at this scholar and that scholar and blah, blah, blah. I've got like four or five hundred books I gotta go through. But he gives me the answer first. And then I have to go do the research as if I didn't know the answer to prove out why the answer I got is the right answer versus all the other answers that are out there. Like with the meter thing, the Hebrew meter thing. He just tells me the answer first. And then I have to go prove it. It's like my geometry teacher. They give you the answer first and then you have to prove the theorem. You know, that was back in, what, 10th grade. I loved my geometry teacher. So, he does things in different ways. Some immediate, some very lingering. So that tells you what he likes. Okay, well, one of the things he likes is lingering communication. Because he could zap us all and we'd have all the answers in the next nanosecond. But he never does that. He wants it to be interactive. And he doesn't care how glitchy it is. Or there'd be no cross and we'd not be the way we are. So what, you think the eternal state's going to be different? Well, yeah, it's going to be different. We aren't sinning. Yeah, we're going to know more. Yeah, we're going to be bigger in our souls. And yeah, we're all going to be able to see him. But certain things are not that different. I say all this because how do you, if you're going to be a king in eternity, you got to know what to expect in eternity to know how to train for it. There's a certain amount of training that's just book learning. There's a certain amount of training that you got to practice with your body. And there's a whole lot of training that's conceptual. Okay, here's my book learning. Here's my experience with my body. 
but now I have to put the two together, integrate them into the big picture. Okay? Which is how to think about it all. So that everything has a place. Otherwise, you don't know how to train to be a king. This is why it takes so long. You know, you're born, and you're going to be, you know, Prince William's going to be a king of England one day. He's taken his whole life to train for that. It's the hardest job on earth. Any royal is. Okay? Same could be said for a prime minister or president of the United States. Ideally, you get to start to train for it when you're a kid. Of course, you know, president of the United States only lasts four or eight years. Prime minister might last 20. But you see the point? Kingship lasts forever. So you need a lot of training. So you need a lot of ideas about how to train. Because you're turning the whole thing yourself, and it's pass-fail. Okay, well, communication's obviously one of those things. That's one of the reasons I'm doing the audio and the video. I'm training. I make a lot of mistakes. It's lingering. You have to, okay, how do I phrase this? Do I phrase this in some other way? And I happen to be a wordsmith, so I like it, but... You know, do I get mean with this person in YouTube comments? Or should I be nice? Why should I be nice? Why should I be nasty? Should I not reply at all? That's a policy decision. You see what I'm talking about? And that's communication. That's the number one thing that's going to happen in eternity. Communication. That's the enjoyment of the eternal state. Is all communication going to be centered on him. Everything's a reflection of him. And those who are not church, and I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, it's been 2,000 years church has been on this planet. It ought to be really big by now. There were 4,000 years before church. So how big is the population of heaven outside of church? And if history keeps going on much longer with church, and it looks like it will, because we're so retarded, unless, because we're so retarded, the rapture happens, how big is that external population? Because we're supposed to be ruling the universe co-jointly with Christ. Okay, well, I, I'm having trouble figuring out how big the population outside church is. I'm saying that the whole population of heaven is something like 100 billion. Church, I don't know if it would reach even 1 billion. So at that point, if the whole population of heaven is like 100 billion, of course that includes the millennium too. Um, I have a hard time believing the church itself is bigger than a billion. So 1 billion to 100 billion. That's basically one person in church per hundred people. That's a good communication ratio. Communication. In other words, and this is the, the most important thing to say about it, the people in the Old Testament and the people after church will not have the high quality of spiritual life that we were given. We are squandering the high quality of our spiritual life. They had to make do with less. Even though we have squandered our spiritual communication, you're born royal, you're born royal. So you have this higher privilege of being able to talk about him. They will not know a lot of the things that we get to know. So we get to have the privilege of talking about those things. The king's job, the primary job of the king, is to communicate to his country. That's the job now, that's the job in eternal state too. The king is a walking standard, a walking repository of his nation's standards. That's why he has to wear the rich clothes. That's why he has to live in a museum. It's a pain in the neck have to live that way I mean I hope you understand if you're wearing a $30,000 dress 
I'm not sure if it costs that much, but pretend. And Donald Trump's wife, her dress cost, what, $126,000, somebody told me. As if that were a waste of money. No, it wasn't a waste of money. A whole industry got spawned because of her dress. A whole bunch of people got paid, mostly poor people got paid because he bought that dress at that price. Now, would I want to wear such a dress on the other hand? No. You know why? Because I'd be paranoid about spilling something on it. Okay, well, guess what? If you're royal, you got to wear stuff like that because it bursts an industry. See, everything's a policy decision. If you buy a pack of gum and you're royal and somebody sees you, and that's exactly what happened to Princess Diana, she goes and buys a pack of gum before she's actually princess. Somebody finds out what she buys, and then, a, you know, two, three, four, five hundred people copy. They want to buy that gum because she bought it. So her buying a pack of gum was not buying a pack of gum. It was much more than that. So you have to have the nice jewels. You have to have the nice cars. You have to have these extensive palaces and all that other stuff. That represents the state. And every decision you make spawns an industry. It communicates, you see. So, you have the privilege of communicating him. You're on stage, and the least to the greatest of us in church are going to have some kind of job that way. So now ask yourself this question, and this feeds back to public person. How do you communicate? Now, are you learning to communicate? There's a skill to it. There's an art to it. It's really hard to talk and think at the same time. There are styles. You can't just say, Oh, brother, that was great. That doesn't do anything. What kind of communication is that? Oh, I didn't like your video. Oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't help me. If you don't like it, do you mind telling me why? I shouldn't even have to go back in the comment to the person who said, I didn't like your video. Or oh, that's blasphemous. What's blasphemous? No information. As bad as Windows help. Some vague statement. If it's critical, that's good. Okay, but give me substance because I can't benefit from your criticism if you don't articulate. So that's the point here. Your job in heaven forever, no matter how long you're going to be, as church, is to communicate. See, because that's why you're supposed to be learning the word, so that you can give it out. People will be hanging on your words because you're royal. Even if you're low royal, you're still royal. Can you communicate? Now, learning a language is not hard. It does require a bit of self-discipline. How you use that language, well, that takes a lifetime. You're always learning. The red cat jumped up on the sofa. All right, well... What kind of red? What kind of sofa? Why did he jump up? You see? You make a statement, and are you really communicating anything with that statement? That role of communication is something Christians kind of understand down here. Oh, we're supposed to give out the gospel. Yeah, honey, do you know what it is? Do you know why it is? Do you know what kind of issues come up when you talk about it? Do you really understand what it is? Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross, and if you believe in him, you're saved. That's the real gospel. Nothing else. It doesn't matter if you understand who Jesus Christ is. It doesn't matter if you understand or even believe he's God. 
It doesn't matter what else you believe about him. If you don't believe he paid for your sins, you don't go to heaven, period, over and out. Whatever else you believe at that point might be relevant for other things, but it doesn't save you. Whether you feel sorry for your sins or not, that doesn't save you. See my point? I'm articulating the gospel. The gospel itself is two sentences. Believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and you are instantly saved forever. That's it. Okay, but there are a lot of questions that go with that. Can you answer them? Do you understand the issues? Do you understand the alternatives? You know, the Muslims say you got to believe in Allah. And you say, in order to be saved in Islam... You have to believe that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah and you believe in Allah. They call that the Shahada. Now, the Quran never explains why that's true. It never explains the alternatives. If anything, it's one of the most impish books you can read. It's always vague. Always dual entendre. Always making fun of itself and making fun of anybody who believes in it. Okay, you don't want your communication to be like that. Train for it down here. Because you really don't understand the gospel or anything else about the Bible until you learn how to communicate it. Because that's going to be your future job up there. Of course, up there is really down here. The eternal state is down here. you got... New Jerusalem hanging over the earth, suspended in the air, and then it's, you know, on the earth counterpart is here, and the whole heavens and the earth are, you know, made over a brand new universe. But earth is still the headquarters. There's going to be a new earth. It's going to be made over. So that tells you a lot. Geography is probably going to be the same. Or similar. And all the deserts will, you know, blossom. I mean, you know, part of that's millennial and part of it's eternal. So you got, you can have a fix for what eternity is like. It's going to be heavily populated. Not as heavily as I'd like. There's going to be a whole lot of human interaction. A whole lot of communication about Jesus Christ. Because the people who didn't learn him down here are going to be discovering him for the first time up there, which is in the eternal state back down here again. <clears throat> and some is going to be talking about him all the time. The king talking about him the most. And if you're king of your kingdom, you are the primary repository of information about him that everybody's going to be anxious to hear. And then everybody, you know, like it says in Jeremiah 3, which is the promise of this, in Jeremiah 31, from the least to the greatest, everybody's going to know me. Yeah, but it's, nobody has a need for anybody to teach him, but everybody has a need to talk about him. Okay, well, let's start learning to talk down here. It isn't just about, and in fact it never is, about knocking on doors to give the gospel. Do you want to make Christ look bad? Knock on doors. That's the rudest thing you can do. God doesn't need traveling salesmen. You're not a vacuum cleaner salesman. You're not the fuller brush man. Although, back in the day when there really was a fuller brush man, that was a pretty pleasant experience. Okay. Traveling salesmen... Some were bad, some were good. That's not what God wants. I don't know who came up with that stupid idea. Oh, we should go knocking on doors. No. You're violating privacy when you do that. You make God look like he's desperate. He's not desperate. We're desperate. We need him. Like Peter says, be prepared. 
And then God will send the, the people to you. Not the other way around. People f came to Christ. He didn't go out to them. I mean, he was on a circuit because people wanted to see him. And it was for their convenience that he did that. But that was after he was established. He would go to a town. I mean, you see the stories in the gospel. He'd go to a town. They announced he was there. And then the people came to him. He didn't go knocking on doors. He went to a central location in the town. And they came to him. Paul did the same thing. He went to a central location where it was known where he would be. He'd go to the Agora or something like that. And then people came to him. <coughs> okay, so start training in his word so that you can communicate it. Because God has people in your periphery who he wants come to you but you're not ready yet you're an emissary for Christ whatever you are in society's eyes doesn't matter you're an emissary for Christ right now so communicate learn to communicate and the best way to learn to communicate is to ask yourself some questions what do I really know about this Bible what do I really know about the gospel what do I know about the doctrines? Do they make sense? In other words, audit everything you think you know. That's what my channel is dedicated to, auditing. I find something in a faith claim that doesn't fit, I post it. And I might be snarky for a while, and then I walk off. I did my job, it's due diligence disclosure, if somebody wants to look at it, it's there. And I don't, I don't crusade or try to get anybody else to buy it. I just have to disclose it and move on. Now, I'm not saying you should do what I do. Because I don't know what God wants for you. I do know that he wants you to know the material. I do know that you're training to be a king. I do know that you cannot communicate unless you practice. Does that mean practicing the way I do? I don't know. I doubt it. Maybe. I can't speak for you. I have to do it this way. But I don't know how you have to do it. I do know you have to learn the material and practice doing it in whatever way you're supposed to. And that you clear with him. So again, unfortunately, this lasted 30 minutes. But there's a very important last point. That you have to learn how to be a communicator. In what manner, in what style, in what timing, with what doctrines, on what topics. I don't know, talk to God. But it's part of being royal. And it's obviously part of being down here. It's the one part about being down here that Christians have a mild clue is valid. But they don't practice. They do Madison Avenue techniques. They use human ideas. And they are forever getting the doctrines wrong. And they make Christ look bad. And their methodologies stink. They hold little potlucks. Or they go knocking on doors. Or come join our fellowship, brother. They make Christ look cheap. Royals aren't supposed to do that. But... They have the right to make up their own rules and they're going to get the consequences of those rules. And you have to decide for yourself what kind of communication style, what kind of communication topics, and how to articulate scripture. Because that's your lifelong job. There are two, you have two offices right now. You are a king in training, and you are a priest. Forever. Christ is high priest. We are a royal priesthood. That's in Peter, and that's in the book of Hebrews. Christ is king priest, Kata Melchizedek. It's a whole different priesthood. whole different kingship from Israel. It's its own 
battlefield royalty and you share in everything he is and has just like he prayed for it in John 17 so that's your office too okay kings communicate priests communicate can you do that if not then you need to learn it's one thing to sit on your pastor learn and live on Bible inside your own life but you have to be able to articulate it too because whoever you are going to be in eternity there's going to be somebody lower than you because you're royal family of God and they won't be so you're turning for yet future people you've never met who are going to live who knows in the future or lived a thousand years ago or two thousand, three thousand, four thousand years ago you got a job that you're training for to talk about him can you? even if you never do it down here you're going to be doing it up there so start figuring out well, you know, do I really know what these doctrines are? If I had to explain it, what would I do? And start practicing. Because that's going to be your lifelong job. Little or much, high or low, your royal family of God. It's a royal job. Peace out.